In this video, I want to talk about the law of large numbers, a few ways that this can be misapplied, and then one way to correctly apply this in order to calculate expected value. Uh, the diagram that you're seeing here shows um, the proportion of ones that we got in a, a sample experiment uh, when we rolled a die um, about 5,000 times. And this demonstrates the law of large numbers because you can see that the um, the proportion of ones um, eventually sort of approaches a theoretical probability uh, or what we would expect to see or how often we would expect to see ones show up when we roll a die. All right? So you'll notice at the beginning there's um, a bit of fluctuation. We start out uh, lower than uh, lower than the probability and then at times we go above right? and then kind of dip back and forth but eventually it sort of levels out and um, the, the technical word for that is converges. Um, so if you take in calculus, we talk about converging to a limit, and this sort of has that, um, that same idea of getting, getting really close to a certain expected number. Right? Now this is just for a sample experiment. Uh, you could roll a different die a different 5,000 times, and your plot might look completely different than this. Uh, because remember, it is possible, like you could roll... Um, you could roll a die 10 times in a row and have a 1 show up every single time. So in that case, the, the probability or the frequency that you're observing 1s would be higher than the expected um, probability over time. Right. So the law of large numbers, let's look at what this says. Uh, consider an event with probability P of A in a single trial. The law of large numbers holds that for a large number of trials, the proportion in which the event A occurs will be close to that uh, expected probability P of A. The larger the number of trials, the closer the proportion should be to, be to P of A. And this law holds as long as each trial is independent of prior trials so that an individual trial always has the same probability P of A. All right, so let's break this down and look at the things that must be in place in order to apply this law. All right, so first of all, um, we have to know the probability in a single trial, and that probability in one trial has to be the same in each of the individual trials. All right, so it has to be independent. So, for example, if you have a, a drawer that's, um, you know, half black socks and half white, then if you pick a sock and don't put it back, then the probability of, of getting a black sock is going to change as you continue to draw socks from the drawer. That's not an independent um, type of event. So that's, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so things that this law would apply to would be uh, like flipping a coin or tossing a die or any of the, the random things that are independent that we've talked about. Um, another thing to notice is that this law is true for a large number of trials. All right, well, how large is large? Um, I think you can kind of get the idea that we're not talking six trials or ten, uh, but what about a hundred? Is that considered a large number of trials? All right, so one way to test it um, is to just uh, look at one out of how many trials you've done, all right, like one out of a hundred, and then look at what happens when you add in one more trial. Consider one out of 101. And then you look at those two probabilities and see if it's changed a lot or if it's still about the same. So of course 1 out of 100 is 0 0.01, right? And then 1 out of 101 is 0 0.00990099 and so forth. Okay, so it did change, um, but you know, it, it's, it's close. It's close to the probability of 1 over 100. Uh, let's look at what happens if we um, look at a thousand trials, right? Versus one thousand one, right? So one out of a thousand, okay, is point zero zero one, and one out of a thousand one is point zero 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 nine 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 zero zero, and so forth. Okay, so again, it's close. Uh, but but you may remember the last one, it was two zeros and then two nines and then zeros again, right? This one has three nines, which means it's it's even closer to this probability than uh, the one out of 101 was to one out of 100, right? And in general, you know, if you, if you can see that the probability doesn't change a whole lot, 
uh, when you make that comparison, then you probably have a large enough number of trials. All right, another observation is that this law does not apply in situations that involve skill. So for example, let's say somebody's just learning how to do cartwheels. Uh, their probability um, of doing a cartwheel versus not doing a cartwheel is not necessarily going to approach one half over time. Um, so it may be absolutely terrible at first, but then as they get better, um, maybe maybe eventually the probability gets close to close to one. All right. So this is quite different than just um, than somebody randomly doing a cartwheel or not. Um, but skill means that the events are not independent because um, you know you're you're building your skills as you perform those events, um, and that affects the outcome of the next event. All right, another observation is that um, as we approach that theoretical probability, we don't necessarily approach it from lower than that probability or from higher, all right? So the first plot that we looked at approached from below, another approached from above, and here's one that actually approaches kind of wavering back and forth. Sometimes, um, sometimes the observed probability after a certain number, number of trials is above the theoretical probability, sometimes it's below, and it just keeps fluctuating back and forth, um, you know, as it gets close to uh, the expected probability. All right, so this factors into our understanding um, of, of how we perceive uh, loss, especially in games um, and, and gambling. So it's, it's tempting to assume, you know, if you play a game at first and um, you're doing sort of poorly, uh, but as you keep playing, if you improve, it's tempting to think that, uh, you know, if you start winning a higher proportion of the time, um, that you would sort of regain back the money that you've lost initially. All right, so we can look at this example to see why that's not always the case. All right, so let's let's say we're playing a coin toss game in which we win a dollar for heads, so heads is winning, and lose a dollar for tails. After 100 tosses, you are $10 in the hole because you have 45 heads and 55 tails. Okay, so you've won $45 um, from, from rolling or from flipping heads, but then you've lost 55 from getting tails, uh, which means you owe $10. You continue playing until you've tossed the coin 1,000 times, at which point you've gotten 480 heads and 520 tails, so plus 480 minus 520. Does this result agree with the law of large numbers? Have you gained back any of your losses? All right, so it does agree with the law of large numbers. Uh, we're expecting the probability um, of heads and tails to each approach 50. So notice heads is increasing from 45% uh, to 48% of the trials, and tails is decreasing from 55 percent to 52 percent okay however um, you're still losing and you're actually losing even more at this point all right so even though um, your the, the proportion of the time that you're winning is getting better um, still overall you're you're continuing to add to this debt right and now um, this is negative forty dollars so you owe even more right so it's um, if you think back to when we looked at the federal debt um, we looked at an example of a few years where uh, where we had a surplus, and the question at that point was, well, how can the federal debt keep increasing if uh, if there's a surplus? And we saw that that happened if um, if the interest that was owed in any given year outweighed the surplus, right? Or um, if you another way to say this is if you um, if this person is losing less badly but they're still losing, all right? So just because you're losing less doesn't mean you're gaining money. It just means you're going uh, more slowly into debt. But you should expect to still see those losses increase over time, though, perhaps at a, a slower rate. All right, another misconception about the law of large numbers uh, is this idea of having winning or losing streaks, all right? So let's say that um, we've flipped a coin five times and we get heads five times in a row. All right. Um, should we expect to see the luck change and to get a tails um, the next time because uh, we might say, well, according to the law of large numbers, we should be getting heads 50% of the time, not all of the time. So we're going to have to change 
um, and get tails at some point. All right, so a couple things to keep in mind here is we're, we're trying to understand um, why this isn't the case and then also why people think that it is. All right, so the law of large numbers does not apply to any one trial. It only talks about um, the, the overall expected probability. What should we see over a large number of trials? Right? So I can't focus in on this one specific trial, one flipping of a coin, and say that it should be um, tails in light of what's happened before. Because right? when you flip that coin, the coin doesn't know anything about um, the things that have happened before. Right? So it's still a 50% chance or a one-half probability. Um, it could be heads, it could be tails, 50-50. It -50. Um, doesn't matter what's happened before. Right? Um, on top of that, we're only looking at six trials here, which is definitely not enough to be able to apply um, the law of large numbers, right? We could, if this were 600 trials, that might make a little bit more sense. All right, now why do people think this though? Because we, we do also sort of um, acknowledge the fact that getting all heads is more unlikely than getting a combination of heads and tails, right? And so if you were to look at um, the chances of getting um, all six heads, six out of six, all right, well, you would find that that probability is uh, one half to the sixth power, which is um, about 2.7% of the time. So it is very unlikely um, that this would happen. So I think that's why people think, oh, well, then it must be tails, all right? But keep in mind, in order to make that calculation to say that this is unlikely, we had to assume that the probability of each of those events, each of those flips, was one half, all right? So it is factored in. It's It's both of those things. There's a 50% chance that that next coin will be um, will be heads or will be tails, and that factors in to making this very unlikely overall that you would get six heads in a row, right? But it, it's already very unlikely that we would get five heads in a row. So that's a, a nice little um, I wouldn't say it's a paradox, but it's you know a little a little mental um, twist to kind of think about how both of those things can be true. All right, let's look next at how we can correctly apply the law of large numbers. Um, it does have a use in, in thinking about expected value. And I think the, the simplest way perhaps to explain what expected value is, is to say that it's uh, just a weighted average, a weighted mean of all of the different events that could possibly happen and their different probabilities. Right? So we consider all of the outcomes and we consider um, the likelihood that each one would happen, and then we average that all out to see um, over time what should we expect. Okay, so this does use the law of of law of large numbers, um, which is sometimes also called the law of averages. So you can see um, perhaps why, because um, you know we are looking at proportions or averages of uh, what happens um, over time over a large number of trials. So let's start with an insurance example, um, and let's say that we have insurance uh, which pays out um, $100,000 for a claim, the policy costs $250, and uh, the insurance company has observed uh, over time, uh, so they're, they're doing a, a relative frequency probability, that 1 in 500 people will make this claim, All right? So they're trying to decide, um, is this a, a good plan? Will they win money or, or gain money or lose money overall, right? So um, if we only had a few number of policies, there's really no way to predict what would happen here, right? Which you can maybe understand then why insurance companies try to sell more policies. Um, but if we only had 100 people who buy into this policy, then they would gain $250 for each of those uh, 100 people, which is $25,000, right? And um, we, we have fewer than 500 people here. So it's, you know, there's really no way to know what will someone make a claim? Will they not? Um, statistically speaking, right? So if no one makes the claim, they're okay. Um, but if one person makes the claim, then they're going to lose or have to pay out $100,000 and then they'd be $75,000 in debt, right? So this is going to fluctuate quite a bit when we have a, a low number of people, um, which are considered to be the trials in this case, right? However, um, while we can't say anything about that few people, we can see, say something about um, a large number of people. All right, so let's say 
let's say now that we're talking about a um, hundred thousand people right? and then let's look at um, on average what they should expect to gain or lose all right so we know for sure um, that those hundred thousand people are going to buy the policy all right so they're going to make 250 times one hundred thousand dollars Okay, and that's uh, 25 million. All right, and then statistically speaking, one out of every 500 will make a claim. So we could expect that, that out of the 100,000 people, um, the probability of a claim is one in 500. All right, or, or we could just um, you know talk about this, this in terms of people. So maybe not in terms of probabilities, but let's see how many um, you know, groups of 500 people there are, all right, and that's 200. So one in 500 is the same as 200 out of 100,000 100, people, right? And then um, we know that for those 200 people, the insurance company will lose the payout amount of $100,000 for those 200 people, all right? So I'll use a negative sign to indicate a loss. So they're losing $20 million overall, okay? So then in terms of, um, of the, the gain or the loss here, well, they're making 25 million, right? And expecting to lose 20 million, which would mean they have an expected value of uh, 5 million altogether, right? Or we could divide by 100,000 and see the expected gain um, per policy and that would be $50 per policy if you divide that by 100,000. All right, so notice um, the law of, of large numbers came into play in assuming that what would happen in these 100,000 cases, or we could call those trials, uh, would be um, would match with this, this probability that we've calculated. Okay, so that's, that's the assumption, and that's where the law of large numbers is used. All right, um, I thought we would do one more example of, of calculating the um, expected value. And um, I pulled some information from a solitaire game that I play. And uh, I thought I would just walk you through this. So um, this is a combination, I think, of, of skill and luck in this game. So theoretically, the game matches you with people um, who have a similar skill level to you. Um, and, then, and then you go from there. Uh, I think there's probably still some some chance involved in who you get matched with, and then of course you've got all of the other the factors involved in the game. Um, you both have the same deck of cards, so you don't have to worry about getting a bad shuffle because the other person gets the same bad shuffle. Um, but you never know; like there could be um, an internet outage or some sort of distraction, or, or there's you know some other factors involved other than skill. All right. So I wouldn't say that this involves um, the law of large numbers because it's not random independent events every time you play the game, um, but the, the expected value principle is, is still at play here. All right, so let me give you some information and we can calculate um, my expected value um, based on the, the probability uh, over which I, I win or lose and how much um, in-game currency I should expect to win or lose. All right, so there's a couple different options. Um, you can play games for these these Z coin things, um, which have no monetary value in the real world. All right, so you can play for two or for ten or and so forth. Um, and then they also have cash games, which um, I've never played, um, but they give you all the information. You can play for a uh, dollar or five dollars and so forth. All right, so I I did calculate my um, my probability of winning. Um, in a, a variety or in a number of different trials. Um, but let's start by just assuming that it's it's purely based on chance and not skill, All right? So then we should expect my um, probability to be about 50%. All right, so let's say I, I just play this first beginner game um, over and over. Um, so the we want to find the expected value. We want to consider all of the different um, events that are happening and the probabilities of each. All right, so one event is that I'm entering, right, and the probability is one because I'm definitely entering, 
and in this um, first novice game, uh, to enter costs 1z, so that would be a, a value of minus 1. Um, then if you win, you win 2z's, and if you lose, you get nothing. All right, so if we assume that I have a 50% chance of winning, 50% chance losing, then my expected value would be um, negative 1z times a probability of 1 plus 2z's times 1 half, so there's a 50% chance that I'll, I'll win those two, right? Or 0z's times 1 half, so there's a 50% chance that I'll um, gain or lose nothing. All right, and then all together, that would be negative 1 plus 2 times a half is 1 plus 0, which would be 0, okay? So um, theoretically, if, if only chance were involved here and I played just this initial game over and over a large number of trials, um, then I should expect to just balance out and not gain or lose any of these Z's, okay? Now, of course, they made one little twist to this, and every two hours you can log on and... Um, claim your free gift of, I think it's five Z's or something like that. So I definitely don't log into the game um, that often, but I think that's their little carrot for getting you to, to play more often. Okay, now my probability of, of winning is actually slightly different. Um, I'm, I, I went back and looked at a uh, hundred, a hundred and, or sorry, no, 206 games. And out of 206 games, um, which uh, you, you can't really claim as a large number of trials, but I got tired of counting at that point. Um, I Out of those, I had one uh, point five zero nine seven, um, so close to 50% of the time, and then I had lost uh, 0.4903, okay, so about 49% uh, of the time. So now we can um, just quickly modify the expected value formula, and the probability of my entering and losing a z is still 1, but now my probability of winning 2, I would multiply that by 0 0.5097, and then I would add uh, 0 z's times 0 0.4903, but of course it doesn't matter, It's that's just going to be 0. All right, and if you do that, you will find that this is um, a positive 0 0.02, okay? So uh, so over time, I should expect on average to win uh, 0 0.02 Zs per game, all right? So if I played 1,000 games, I should expect to win uh, 20 Zs, which have no real-world value at all, okay? Um, so now let's look at the cash games, and let's look at the uh, the dollar one, and you know, we'll look at some of these. Okay, so now to enter for the dollar one, it's sixty cents. Right, winning, you win a dollar, and losing, you get nothing. All right, so if you're okay with this, I think I'm just going to skip the probability of losing because we keep multiplying by zero, and that doesn't actually um, affect anything. So really, the two choices are just either you lose your entry fee or you win something. Okay, so if we use my um, my probabilities, then expected value would be negative uh, 60 cents times about 50% of the time, or about 51% of the time. Okay, and then plus uh, winning a dollar about 49% of the time. Okay, so what's the expected value? Um, that is negative, uh, negative 90 cents. Uh, sorry, negative, negative 9 cents. Okay, so if I play this game a large number of times, um, if this were completely random and, and just due to chance, then I should expect to lose about 9 cents per game. Okay, it just gets even worse with the $5 games, um, but it gets worse at the same proportion. All right, so if you'll notice a dollar to 60 cents is the same ratio as five dollars to three dollars all right so actually with uh, you can work this out for yourself but with the five dollar games you the expected value is negative 45 cents okay um, 
there it keeps going and, and believe it or not some people will actually gamble three hundred dollars to play one solitaire game um, and the proportions different here the entry fee uh, is only um, one hundred and seventy five dollars all right so if we do the expected value now all right we would lose one hundred and seventy five dollars for sure for entering and then if we win we get three hundred dollars um, but I would expect that to only happen um, about 51% of the time. All right. And uh, overall, that's still a negative expected value of losing about $22.09 per game. Okay. Which is, uh, which is better than playing the, um, it's actually better than playing the, the dollar game 300 times. So if you play that one 300 times, you'll lose $27.00. Whereas if you play this game once, you'll only lose $22.09. All right, so you can see how this, again, factors into that, um, the, the misconception about um, gaining back losses. Or, or maybe somebody looks at this and thinks, oh, you know, I've got a better chance of, of winning with this lower entry fee. This is a better deal. Um, but really, it just means over time you, you lose less money per game, um, but you're still losing money. All right, so I think the trick for expected value is that you just need to um, be aware of all of the different events that could happen. So we looked at the insurance example where um, we had the event of buying the policy and then the event of a payout. Um, games like this, there's an entry fee and then options for winning or losing. Um, some of the, the lottery and, and Powerball examples that you'll see in your homework um, there are just a, a number of different prizes that you can win. So you just want to go through and find um, all of those different events and all of the different probabilities for winning each type of prize. Okay, and then we're all, all we're doing is just taking uh, what's called a weighted average. So we're just adding everything up and um, by multiplying it by these probabilities, um, that's, that's averaging everything out. All right, one last comment about this game, and um, that is the the idea of the house edge. So I just wanted you to see this and, and we'll conclude with this. Um, but you'll notice um, there is always a winner in these games and that is the app or the person who made this game. All right, so let's look at the $300 game and see what happens here. So um, these are two player games um, playing, playing against each other. All right, so two players contribute this entry fee. All right, so from the game's perspective, um, they're gaining an entry fee of... Uh, two times one hundred and seventy-five dollars, right? Which is, uh, which is three fifty. Okay, and then they'll need to pay out three hundred dollars to the winner, so minus three hundred, right? So on one of these games alone, the house edge is fifty dollars. They're going to make fifty dollars from this one game. Okay, and then in the one dollar example, we've got two players who are each entering with sixty cents. Right, so the house gains $1.20, and then they pay out a dollar to the winner, and they make 20 cents on every one of these games. Okay, so uh, you, you never want to make the mistake of thinking that this is, um, you know, not a money-making venture. And there is, again, one person who's always gaining from these games, and that's the person who's, um, who's made the game.